Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I'm Luke Gran. I work at a wonderful grassroots farmer organization, nonprofit organization called Practical Farmers of Iowa. And we are happy to have you all here tonight uh, to learn from farmers with our Farminars, which is free online learning from Practical Farmers of Iowa. And I brought a little uh, show and tell today. We, uh, should I can get this? Put the this is our field day guide, our field day uh, sign that we put up at every on-farm field day. And uh, I just wanted to bring this along today and say that this, these are our on-farm, uh, excuse me, our online field days, and uh, we're really happy you're all here. So I just wanted to give a little bit of background about Practical Farmers of Iowa. We, uh, we are great, a grant-based organization, so the, the ability for us to do things is, is dependent on our uh, ability to write grants and to uh, deliver on uh, on grant deliverables and whatnot. And so that's why we uh, are ask, asking one poll question from you all tonight, and that is how many folks are watching, because we like to keep track of uh, how many people we're servicing so we can tell that to the folks that, uh, that give us money so we can pay farmers like Adam Montry and Sarah Hansen tonight to share their knowledge with you. And so we're very excited to have you here and to learn. Um, last week we had a, or two weeks ago, we had our first of the of the winter series uh, of the farm and ours on value added considerations. And uh, today we're doing the high tunnels. And uh, next in two weeks we'll do a uh, farm and our on tomatoes with a farmer from Vermont and a farmer from Iowa, uh, talking about growing tomatoes inside and outside. So we're happy to have you here, and we'll just go go ahead and go along. I just wanted to mention two more things. Um, these are free to view. Uh, for everyone, so uh, we wanted to thank our supporters for the, this series, and that is Farm Aid and the Beginning Farmer Rancher Development Program uh, listed on, on the screen here today. Let's go to the next slide. If you watched any of the fall series and you haven't yet filled out your online survey, please go to this link um, and fill out the quick survey. It should take about two minutes, and that's how we can we can really learn how to even make these even better for everybody. So please do give us your feedback if you uh, saw any farminars in the fall. We just finished our annual conference this last weekend, uh, the 7th and 8th of January. And it was a really great turnout. We had over 400 farmers from around uh, the state of Iowa, the Midwest, who came to uh, network and learn from each other and share stories, as well as to build community. And uh, these are just a sampling of some of the photos here uh, of the folks, uh, farmers learning from other farmers. And I just wanted to put that up there and acknowledge that. And, and it was just a really wonderful weekend. So we're happy to have everyone uh, who's, who's in attendance tonight that went to that. Uh, we just had a really great time. And we're happy that, uh, that we could put that on. And we had, saw so many great farmers together. The Savings Incentive Program is, is really exciting for beginning farmers who farm in the state of Iowa. Uh, this is just a sampling of, of, the, of the beginning farmers in that special program, which is a savings match. So over two years, those beginners will save $100 a month. And after two years of, of completing program requirements, like attending four PFI events, kind of like tonight, this, this would count as one of those events, um, on-farm, online, uh, at workshops and conferences, those all count. Four, four per year is the minimum. Uh, they have to attend uh, three meetings with a mentor in one year, uh, an experienced farmer mentor. And um, finally, they have to write or maintain a business plan. So we just really wanted to especially thank, thank our uh, beginning farmers in that savings incentive program. It's a really exciting time for beginning farmers, and we uh, like to promote them whenever we can. So if, if, you're, if you're not a member and you're watching tonight, I encourage you to join Practical Farmers of Iowa uh, right now. You can do it online, as a matter of fact. If you're a student, it's just $15 a year uh, for an individual, $35. And if you want to get the whole farm involved, it's just $45 uh, per year for membership. Uh, you can also make a generous donation, which would be much appreciated. And you can also, don't forget to check out our archive library of past farminars, so you can learn from other farmers who, uh, who you haven't uh, heard from yet. And so that's just at our archive library on our website. We have one event for all those folks that are within a drive of Marshalltown in central Iowa. Uh, the Next Generation Retreat is the end of January. This is a great opportunity, to, opportunity to, to network with 30 to 40 beginning farmers, as well as learn from five experienced farmers. And so if you're in the area, there's just a few spots left, but we'd love to have you attend that event. And uh, let's go to the next slide. 
a great event because, like all PFI events, you learn from farmers themselves, folks that are out there doing it. And these are just a, an example of the three farmers that we're going to have. Uh, Laura Frerichs from central Minnesota, some Minnesota people here tonight, um, and Rick Hartman from central Iowa, small potatoes farm, an acoustics farm. Uh, they're a dairy, a uh, farmstead cheesery in, uh, in Iowa. And they're all going to share on market research, banking, accounting, and financing. Kind of the, uh, what a lot of people are intimidated by, but this is a great way to learn from folks who are, who are practic you know, doing the, the, the practical farm record keeping and all that. So you can uh, definitely encourage folks to attend, and you can register online right now by following the link on your screen. I just wanted to have uh, one note here as well before we move on to, uh, to, to have Adam begin. And that is, uh, if you could uh, try to save your questions um, until after the, the beginner, Sarah Hansen, gets to ask hers. Uh, if you have a follow-up question to the question that, uh, that Sarah's on, uh, feel free to send a question to the chat box. But if it's uh, an unrelated question, try to save that to the end. And we'll, we'll definitely reserve 20 to 30 minutes uh, at the end of the presentation for all the questions from folks that are watching. Uh, and questions can go through that chat box, as I mentioned above on your screen. So Adam, let's load up your PowerPoint, and we'll have you take over. All right, can everyone hear me? All right, so just wait for it to come up here. So we'll start by saying, you know, thanks to PFI for, for asking me to do this again. It's, it's always fun to do these. We did one last year and done a couple other things with PFI. And, um, yeah, I'd like to say, kind of echo what Luke said, that you know, if you're a farmer and or a supporter of, of farms, um, and I'm guessing you are if you showed up on this tonight, that you know, membership is really a, a big thing and, and it's really meaningful. And even if you don't live in the state, so you know, if you don't live in Iowa, it doesn't mean that you can't be a member. We're members at home. You know, we live in Michigan, but uh, we're still PFI members and we still get a lot of benefits from uh, from being members. So I'll just echo that again and, and say thanks for them for organizing all these kinds of things. Uh, also say thanks to Sarah early on. As you can see, this really nice slide setup. Um, I'm going to not take any kind of credit for it whatsoever. She went ahead and, and put them together and put the background together and, and I was just able to drop in and change her words to, to my words and, and go from there. So thanks Sarah for, for putting that all together too. So we're going to be quick here to get through these, um, just kind of a little bit of brief background, kind of where I'm at, what I'm doing, um, and then turn it over to Sarah, and then uh, make sure that we have plenty of time for questions. So again, I'm going to go through here fairly quickly um, and, and get to the questions. So as you can see, you know, there's our farm, is, is 10 Hens Farm. So um, one, of, one of my jobs is, is farming at home for profit. That's our one hoop house that's up right now, it's 34 by 96 feet, um, and it's stationary, and we just bought another 26 by 48 movable one that uh, is in a pile in our yard right now, which was the intention. It just got delivered late, and it was past our planting date for fall stuff, and we had other stuff going on, so we said, let's just wait and, uh, and go from there, and we'll build it in the spring and have it ready for tomatoes. Um, and then you can see there's contact information as well. So there's my email, um, my office phone number, and then we also have a, a Hoop House website that recently launched that is a work in progress, but the, it is up and running. So um, you know, here again is Sarah's map, and um, you know we're pretty much in the central lower peninsula of Michigan, so right about where that second I is. Um, after the H, right at the bottom of there is about where we're at. So. Um, when we start talking about year-round farming or 12-month farming um, or harvesting and farming for, for extended seasons even, um, you know, we're about, you know, on the map we're probably zone, the colder part of zone 5 where we're at at home, we kind of sit down in this little bowl that's just north of Lansing and we have this little cold part. So I'd say we're, uh, yep, there it is. I'd say we're about the, you know, it's arguably that we're the warmer part of zone 4. So. Uh, we're, we're consistently, even though we're 10 miles from uh, MSU's campus, we're consistently 15, 10 to 15 degrees colder. And then the student farm is about five miles south of campus. And we're consistently at least five degrees colder than that at home. 
So here's a picture of our farm, um, or our farmhouse at least. So we moved in in the summer of 2007 with an older orchard site that had been split up into a bunch of parcels a while ago. Um, it's two acres total, including our house, our yard, and, and a, a big planting of you know, five or six big black walnuts. Um, so we grow on about three quarters of an acre or so outdoors, and then we have this one 34 by 96 foot hoop house. Uh, again, we're adding another 26 by 48 movable and um, expanding about three quarters of an acre or so for next year. So my other job is that I work as an outreach coordinator with farmers around the, the state and the country um, through the Michigan State University Student Organic Farm. So the farm's been in existence for about 11 years or so. We, you can see here is kind of our hoop house row. So on the right, we've got four hoop houses there. There's three 20 by 96s. The one closest to us, uh, let's see if I can grab this clicker here. Yep, that one right there is uh, uh, 30 by 96. The one in the back left is uh, 30 by 96 as well. And then the one um, on the front closest to the, the front of the picture on the left is a 30 by uh, 144. So we have those six. We also have a uh, 30 by 96 that's movable that's not kind of in this row here. It's at a, a little bit towards the other side of the farm. I mean, it's got enough room for four moves. Um, so all in all, and then we've got some heated space as well for transplants and that. So all in all, we've got about 17,000 to 18,000 square feet of unheated uh, high tunnel or hoop house space. In addition to that, we've got an acre uh, hay grove tunnel system, which is two, basically 200 by 200, so close to an acre, not quite. Um, that has, in partnership with some other folks at MSU, that Eric Hansen and Greg Lang work on raspberries and sweet cherries in tunnels. And these tunnels are three season tunnels. They're not four season tunnels, so they aren't constructed to withstand the snows of the winter. So you can see that black plastic or that black tarp that's rolled up in between the bays that actually has the top plastic on it. And in the winter, you pull it down, tie it down in there, tarp it, and then when there's you know, past the risk of snow or heavy snow in the spring that gets pulled back out. Um, here's a picture of the movable one. We got it up late in the fall. We knew, this was just taken last week, we knew we weren't gonna um, get anything in there early enough. Uh, we'll talk some about planting dates later on, but October 15th is about as late as we can go most years. This got done later than that, but underneath that roll cover there, we dropped in some spinach just to see what would happen. And it, like we thought, it just kind of germinated and it's just sitting there with its cotyledons out. Uh, but that will get planted early on here. And again, it's got you know movable, so it's a, a rail system here, or a pipe rail where the wheels sit on top of a rail, that's a round rail that sits down on the ground and then it gets anchored down, um, which is very, very important on those pipes there you see in the middle. Here's a couple pictures that were taken last week. So um, they were taken early in the morning. So those of you who do grow year round know that um, or at least extend of the season, know that when it's really cold, the crops can freeze and they can kind of fall down a little bit and look like they're really not doing well. And if we harvest them, they go ahead and uh, turn to mush when we bring them inside. But if we wait and let them thaw out, then uh, they get sweeter and we, uh, we've got you know, the ability to harvest them. So these were taken early in the morning, so some of them do look like they're a little hunched over. There's some Swiss chard in the front, some uh, collards there in the middle, and then way in the back there's some kale. So here is some um, baby leaf salad mix. So you can see there, there's four different things that are going into that. Um, and then on each side of that is some baby spinach. And then here's kind of the poster season for cool season production or for winter production for us is spinach. It's kind of the, the go-to. You know it's going to be able to take these really, really cold temperatures. Um, you know you can plant it late if you don't get stuff uh, in on time. It's kind of our last thing to get planted. And, uh, and it pretty much takes care of itself. So you know, here's a quick kind of rundown of what we grow. You know, we do do the warm season things, tomatoes, pepper, eggplant, cucumbers, basil. Um, we also do a number of cool season crops. And we've kind of broken our cool season crops out into things like um, heading crops, which would be head lettuce, um, Chinese cabbage, those hot soy, those kinds of crops, then the leafy crops or leafy greens, which would be, um, or cooking greens like collards and kale, chard, those crops. Um, 
And then we also have baby leaf salad mix um, that's in there as well. So you can think of it as you know anything that's cut really small and then mixed into a mix. Uh, we do do some culinary herbs in the winter. We do cilantro and parsley. And then again in the summer we do basil. Um, we have done some cut flower stuff. There's clearly people who know a lot more about doing cut flowers in tunnels than, than we do. Um, but we have fooled around with some. Um, and then again, the small fruit, so the raspberries, strawberries, and the tree fruit, mostly in the four se or the three season tunnel. So just to say real quick, here's a picture of some work we've done with, with PFI. And I think Sarah's going to talk a little bit more about the one that we did this year where Sarah and I got a chance to meet. Um, but in 2009, PFI put on a, a workshop that was brought a bunch of farmers together and um, at Abbey Hills Farm. We were able to put this tunnel up in, in a two-day workshop with a one-day prep before that. And then here was this year's, um, and I'll leave that. Is that for Sarah to talk a little bit about that one? So with that, why don't we go ahead and turn it over to Sarah. She can talk some about what she does, and then we can, uh, we can hop right into the questions. Uh, Mark Gatner and Andy McKee. So, and I I haven't looked at them yet. They just came in the mail like two days ago. So let's see if we can hop here to Sarah's questions. Yep. So Sarah, do you want to go ahead and read those? Or I can read them. So Sarah sent me a couple questions, or ten questions or so, that that we can go through here and uh, answer them as we go through. And then once we get through these, I think we're going to open it up to questions. Uh, so the first one was her production goals still, are to sell um, early spring CSA shares. Yep, I'm still variety able of to uh, view any slides here on my end. All right, so if it's uh, if everyone's all right, it sounds like some of the technology is working and some isn't. I'll go ahead and read these questions. So what happened is Sarah sent me the questions, and then we you know, did some responses for them, and then we'll go through those and then answer answer other questions too. And we'll get to yours, Craig. I know you've asked it twice about the short way. There's a picture coming up that'll answer that. So one of her production goals is to share early spring CSA shares and provide a variety of produce over a four-week period. The crops that she'd like to produce include spinach, salad mix, kale, bunching onions, charred cilantro, salad turnips, radishes, carrots, beets, and more. So what would we suggest is the earliest planting date to consider given that she won't have supplemental heat in her structure? So what we have is kind of a real loose um, planting schedule that we use. Um, there's the way it looks here, if everyone's getting it up on your screen, is we've got the crop on the left and we've got different cultivars that we suggest they clearly are not the only ones, and we don't want them to seem like they're the only ones. They're just the ones that we've had success with. And then we've got whether they're direct seeded or transplanted. So clearly transplanting, you're going to have you know, a small plant that you put in. And then there's the seeding date in the next column. Um, if they're transplanted, they also have a scheduled transplant date, um, which you can see in that scheduled transplant date column. The calendar week and week of the year um, correspond to each of those two dates. So um, what, we, what we say is, so week three, if we take that top line, calendar week three is the third week of January. So the first week of February, depending on the year, would be you know, the fifth calendar week. And, and I'm sorry, the first week of February would be the fifth calendar week, and so on. So there's a question from Coyote Ridge. That, so we're in the colder part of zone four. I think as you go further south, um, so when you get down to zone you know, six and seven, I would say that they're bumping these spring dates um, or spring planting dates maybe a week to two weeks, as, as much as three weeks earlier down you know, zone seven. And then as they get colder, they're going ahead and, and bumping it um, back even further. So farms that we work with in the Upper Peninsula, which are borderline zone three, zone four, are looking more at where early February, they're looking more like the third week of February or the you know even the first week of March depending on what their their microclimate is so 
So I'm not seeing slides on my end, but I'm going to pull up the presentation I have here and I can read the questions and we can answer those too. So let's go to question two that Sarah had was, are there specific varieties that we would highly recommend for early spring production? Um, for example, you know, what are some of our favorite varieties of greens? So I would say that you know, if we go back to saying you know, spinach is maybe our you know, number one um, winter tolerant crop. So we, we tend to grow space. It, it kind of depends on your market. So space is a smooth leaf. A lot of the farmers we work with in the Northeast use more of the Savoid leaf. Um, I think they're using things like Thai, Renegade, um, but for us we use mostly space. We have grown some Red Cardinal, which is the the winter or the um, the green leaf with the the red vein in it. Uh, we also like for spinach we grown winter density, which is kind of a, a bib romaine cross. Um, Adriana, which is a green butterhead. Uh, I really, really like it. That's, our, that's my favorite lettuce to grow. That's our favorite one at our farm, too. It, it used to be Hermosa, and then the new, um, the new variety in the line or in the breeding line is called Adriana. And then we've also grown Red Cross, which is a, a red type butterhead or butter crunch. For carrots, we really like Napoli which is you know, kind of Elliot Coleman's standby for winter, winter ones. We also like sugar snacks. Uh, sugar snacks grows really nice. It's long slender. We just make sure that our soil is really loose before we put it in and that we really pop them before we harvest them because they're so long and tapered that there's potential for them to break off, um, for the tips of them to break off. So it looks like we're back up here with the slides. Looks good. So. Here we are. So radishes, um, we really like Crunchy Royale. We just started growing that this year. It's a uh, smaller red, really nice you know, radish. And then we, we've also grown Chariette, which is another red one. Easter egg we've done. We've tried some of the French breakfast ones. We have a farmer by us that, grows, that sells at the same market we sell that just grows really great French breakfast radishes. And we just say there's, there's no reason for us to grow those, so we try to grow something different. They do such a good job. And, and we don't want to have a flood of those in the market anyway. And Bright Light Swiss Chard is clearly a, a one that we really like for chard. Uh, we don't have a huge market for, for chard, but people who do buy it tend to buy it pretty frequently. Um, for our baby salad, we, uh, we tend to do three mixes. So here they are kind of in order. So we do a, a, just a, a lettuce mix, which is that green royal oak and that garrison. Um, which is a, a green oak leaf and a red oak leaf. Then we have a salad mix, which is those two lettuces plus red Russian kale and mizuna. Um, and then we have a spicy salad mix, which is both those lettuces, both those greens, and then also adds red giant mustard, and then either suri or astro arugula. We, we grow them kind of um, depending on what seed we have. And, and they're two really differently shaped leaves. So the Surrey is really um, looks like the wild arugula, and the aster is more like a lobe-like leaf. So question three, considering purchasing row cover. So this is for the question that just came up. Do pe yes, people use row covers, or are people using row covers? Um, so for extra protection when necessary, given a limited startup budget, what would I recommend? So we kind of do two things. So here's the student farm version. It's actually poly, it's not row cover, so it's four mil poly, and in some of the other houses we use the six mil that comes off the roof. Um, so the, the, the four mil or the poly in here, we used to use row cover at the student farm. We've stopped doing that mostly because of durability. We have so many students coming and going. We have so many volunteers coming and going um, that we just, row cover gets beaten up pretty easily uh, if you're not careful, and so we've just gone ahead and, and switched over to the poly. So at home, what we do is more this, this style. So if we flip back one and think about the student farm, so underneath here, you can kind of see there's all this EMT conduit that makes kind of an arch going across. And uh, so it, all right, you can see it. If I can get this clicker to work. Right there, you can kind of see all these different conduit pieces. It's just half inch and three quarter inch that's bent. 
So that works really well to hold the poly, and we need something heavy duty to hold it because it's heavy. But um, it also costs a lot more to do that. So there, in a 30 by 96, there's about 300, $250 to $300 worth of conduit to support this, this layer of poly. I should say real quickly also, so you'll see in the next picture, right? So this is ours at home. You can clearly see it's winter with all the roof or all the snow on the roof. Um, we use row cover. It's Agribond 19. And what we've done is you can kind of see it right here, where you can see that clicker, is there's um, a wire strainer. And then running end to end, you can see it. Here's one row. Here's one row. Here's one. And here's one are four runs of high tensile wire. And they're just tied into the end walls at the far end. They're metal end walls, so I feel comfortable pulling them. But uh, if not, we could put some stakes in the ground or some posts in the ground and tie onto those. And then we cover with this row cover. So here you can see it's kind of open. We use three separate pieces so that we, we could use one piece, but then we would have to push from one end to the other end. Um, but this way, we only need, we have a divider where that line or where that arrow is, and then there's another space up here. So it's three 30 by 40 foot pieces. And the 40 feet goes from here up to here over across and then down. So that's what those pieces do. And then on the ends, we just have solid pieces that are six feet um, by 34 feet or so, 33 feet. And they kind of stick on the ends and they stay there. So for this system, the support for it with the, the wire strainer, or the wall the wire strainers and the, the high tensile wire, everything worked out to about $60. So it's a whole, and we have a lot of extra high tensile wire, so enough to do another ton, another probably, you know, five or six tunnels with it. So it's it's really affordable to do it this way. And then we can talk about a little about the row cover versus the poly. So the while the, the we already talked about durability issues, the the row cover isn't as durable, but it's a lot more breathable. So while the the poly might be more durable, if it gets really hot or sunny even, and you're not there to open it it's going to cook pretty quickly underneath there. It's going to heat up really fast and be really hot. Well, for us, both having off-farm jobs, it's really nice to have this kind of row cover on it so that if we leave in the morning to go to campus it's, and it's dark and it's cold and it's 8 degrees or minus 5 degrees, something like that, we don't have to go in there and open the tunnel if we know it's going to be sunny. We'll just say we know we're not going to get as much heat in there, we're not going to get as much light into the ground, but we're just going to go ahead and leave that cover there. So, and because it's breathable, we don't have to worry about cooking stuff underneath there. All right, so by early June, our goal is to have transitioned to beds of tomatoes, eggplant, pepper, cucumber, et cetera, and then shift the portion of the growing space back to greens for fall early, slash early winter harvest. What would be optimal dates for planting spinach and other salad greens for fall slash early winter harvest? So if we go back to this, we kind of have this top section here is where our spring, our bottom section here is fall. So we go ahead and for us, again, in the, the colder part of zone five, warmer part of zone four, our planting dates are basically August 1st through October 15th. Um, so August 1st, that first week of August, we need to get things like scallions and carrots in if we want to have them um, to go ahead and, and get them uh, growing and up to size just because they're so slow to germinate and they're slow, so slow to go to grow. So let's answer, yeah, it's, uh, it's also at hoophouses.msu.edu or hoophouse.msu.edu um, is a new website we just launched. It's a work in progress, but under the resources section, there is this one. There's a couple other ones as well, and we'll be putting up more and more as we keep going on these. Um, so kind of our progression is those, are those carrots and, uh, and, and scallions. And then we move into things like some head lettuce, kale, chard, and sort of the mid to middish part of September. Um, and then baby salad mix and spinach are kind of the last things to go in at the very end. So we, uh, we just kind of go ahead and, and run the gamut of it. And these dates should be kind of considered not the only dates to plant, but kind of the, the earliest dates that we go um, that we, we go ahead and do stuff in the tunnel with them. 
So do we use shade cloth on the structures during the hot summer months? So here's a picture of ours at home last summer. You can see outside we've got these sunflowers and inside uh, these are all tomatoes here. Right? So we clearly don't have shade cloth up on top here. We tried that early on to keep it a little cool and what we found was that especially with the fruiting crops that that we ended up taking away or taking out even with minimal shade cloth too much of the energy and they were having a really we were getting really low light levels we we're getting a lot of stretching and not great fruit production now that's not to say that if someone who's further south than us um, you know has really intense sun and has really high temperatures you know I think that I think that a shade cloth is an option and I've definitely heard people talk about that down in you know places like West Virginia southern um, even southern Ohio um, into Kentucky, Tennessee, and clearly, you know, in the southeast U.S., the people are using shade cloth. It just depends on, um, you know, how warm and how far south they are. But we we don't use shade cloth in there. So there's a question about lettuce and shade cloth. So there's a farmer that we work with that um, tried doing it. That's about you know, 25 miles from here that tried to do shade cloth because she wanted to do lettuce all through the summer. And she just ended up getting a lot of stretching too and just wasn't happy with it. And so she, what she decided instead was that that space was too valuable or too much of a premium to put lettuce in there. So she used some of the um, heat tolerant lettuces, which are, we have now, which are out. And she also used um, some shade cloth outside um, low to the ground over her lettuces. So that's, that's an option as well. So here we had a question earlier about you know irrigation. So Sarah says she's installed a hydrant in the structure, but still needs to set up an irrigation. In the past, she's used both mini sprinkler systems and drip. So her plan is to orient the beds north-south, about four and a half feet wide and one and a half feet between the walkways, with the main walkway along the north side of the structure. Do you have advice as to which systems might be best for overall production goals? So here's a picture of what we how we usually set up our tunnels. Um, so you can see this the beds are running the short distance across right and then each of these is a drip line so what we have you can't see it in this picture but right where the arrow is right now there's a header that runs this whole length it's a one inch poly header and then for each bed we have two drip lines and these again are about a three foot bed so for each one it gets two drip lines so we use drip all fall spring I'm sorry, spring, summer, and fall on transplanted crops. Um, on non-transplanted crops, so ones that are direct seeded like salamix, it's so close together, we water with a wand and a breaker. For us, when we're on wells in Michigan, um, we have really high levels of iron and really high levels of um, dissolved, dissolved calcium from our limestone aquifers. So what happens is that we um, we get some clogging of emitters and the other thing that we get with the overhead irrigation so clearly we've seen people that can that'll drop spinners down from here and and turn them on and I think that works great um, based on water quality for us our water is so heavy with iron especially coming from wells that we end up staining the plastic if we get any you know get continual water on there from irrigation systems so I'm not saying that it shouldn't be done or that it couldn't be done but for us, it would take a little bit more planning. We were actually talking to someone last week about how to do it and how you can adjust how far the sprayer goes or how far the, the range of the spinner is so that we might be able to, uh, to use some of the, the overhead, which I'm interested in. Although then you have the challenge of, you know, it does really well for germination, but it's also, you know, putting moisture on the foliage. And when you start to get moisture on the foliage and you get humid conditions, you start to have some disease pressure possibilities, especially fungal diseases in the tunnels. All right, so in my experience, which crops have been most profitable, which crops have been in highest demand, and which crops have we grown in the past that we no longer grow? So those are all really good questions. You know, clearly, tomatoes are the, a money maker, right? It's a big, big money maker. So we grow both slicers. We like big beef. Um, that's you know there's there's a lot of other cultivars out there that people use that's just one that that we like for an indeterminate 
Um, we also grow some cher cherries as well. So there's you know everyone's favorite sun golds on the on the left. Um, so for our cherries, we usually grow sun gold, uh, black cherry, and super sweet one million is the red. And then we usually put out, you know, just boxes, pints of red, but then we also do pints of mixed, so mixes of the, the purple, orange, and yellow, or I'm sorry, purple, orange, and red. And then, again, our market is, is asking for red slicer tomatoes. Um, there's one other farmer, actually, the farmer that grows the, the radishes, the, the French breakfast radishes that we work with, too, and they're at our market, and, and they grow a lot of heirlooms both for their other markets that they're at, and they bring heirlooms to the market that we sell it to, and so since it's a small market, it's only about 9 to 12 vendors, depending on the time of year, um, or in the middle of winter, it's, it can get as low as you know five, four, or 5 or 6. Um, we just let them go ahead and grow those heirlooms, and they can bring them, and we stick with the red slicers at home for now. So other things that we make money, so that's kind of our warm season one, right, is the tomatoes. Our cool season one is our salad mix. So there's an example of what it looks like. There it is bagged up in the back. Um, so we sell it two ways. We, we used to sell it in six ounce bags um, during the summer and then four ounce bags in the winter and they were all five dollars. We've now switched to selling them in all in three ounce bags for I'm sorry, all in four ounce bags for three dollars. So it's about, wait, let me get that right. Yeah, four ounce bags for three dollars. So it's about twelve dollars a pound. And uh, all right, sorry, no. Three ounce bags for yeah, four ounce bags for three dollars. Sorry, we switched our prices recently, so I had to think about it. Um, and so we sell those for three dollars a bag or two for. Five dollars, and they can mix and match um, whether they want, you know, one baby salad mix and one baby spinach, or a baby salad mix and a spicy salad mix, or a lettuce mix and a salad mix, or any kind of combination of that. That's clearly a big money maker for us too. Um, carrots are a huge one. We planted twice as many carrots as we did last year and sold out in the middle of December. So we. Uh, we sold out in the middle of January last year, so carrots are definitely something that, that we're going to be growing more of. People love them. I think it, you know, one thing, you know, Elliot talks about it and a lot of farmers talk about it getting really sweet in the winter. You know, the other piece to that is that when that's on our table and we have a lot of other greens, it's kind of like, like the radishes do the same thing. We might not make a lot of money on radishes. We do make money on carrots, but when you have like reds and green, or reds and and oranges and those other colors mixed in on the table where there's a lot of green, you can kind of space it out evenly. So we might put like bags of baby spinach and bags of baby salad, then a row of carrots, and then a bag of spinach and some bok choy or, or chard or kale, and then a thing of uh, radishes. Just those colors really brighten up the table. It doesn't look like the only thing you're selling is green, even if you have you know 15 different kinds of green things. One thing we don't grow anymore are scallions in the tunnel. Um, we've tried it for three years now. They grow really well. They do really well. Um, the evergreen hardy white are a different genus and species than, than the other scallions that you can buy. And they are actually a perennial and they do really well overwintering. Um, but we don't sell them. So for us, it just has been a decision that we might do a small amount outside in, the, in season and take them. But in the tunnel, that space is too much of a premium for us to to, to fill it up with scallions. And the other thing is uh, is zucchini or yellow squash, um, even the bush types, we just don't even grow them inside anymore. There's not a great premium for them. We can put them outside and put some row cover on them. And in the tunnel, they get powdery mildew really easily. It's, really, it's a humid environment, but there's not moisture on their foliage because they're getting dripped, and, and it's just perfect for, for powdery mildew. So we've just so those would be, I'd say, the two definite ones that we've stopped growing are scallions and, and the zucchini or, or summer squash. So thoughts on pricing? Crops grown in the hoop house, have we priced hoop crops, hoop house grown crops higher than or the same as other field grown crops? I think that there is no doubt that hoop house crops should be higher priced than, uh, than field grown crops. Mostly because you're getting them earlier already, um, so you have a premium of not a lot on the market, 
and high demand, especially when you think about tomatoes early on. Um, and the other thing is it's costing you more to grow them, right? So you had to pay for that hoop house. Um, so if you are growing them in a space that costs more for you to grow them in, then you should be charging more. So here's a kind of quick way that we think about pricing. You know, we've talked to some of you about this already and on some other webinars, but there's like the you know, traditional way, which is cost of production plus profit, which is a good way to do it and it should be recorded. Um, you know, I know other people do what other farmers are pricing it. So you see the people walking around at market looking at other prices and, and, uh, and picking their prices from there. You know, other outlet pricing like a grocery store or a co-op, you know, that's kind of like a semi-wholesale market. I would say that you should be higher than those. You know, what you would pay, I definitely know that farmers have done that, and that sometimes we do it. It's kind of like, a, well, I don't know, I'd, I'd pay about this much for it. Um, and then the other way that we kind of think about it is this, what do we want to make? So we combine that traditional one, so we know our cost of production, um, it, but then we say, how much do we want to be making? So in our tunnel, we said by year three, which would be this upcoming year, we want to be making grossing 20K or 20,000 out of it. So here's a quick example. We've got 20 beds that are about 90 square feet. They're three by 30, and I like easy math, so we say they're 100 square feet just for this purpose. Um, so in 100 square feet, or 90 square feet, we can get head lettuce um, in at eight by eight inch spacing. We can get 180 heads in a, in a bed. So if we have 20 beds and we wanna make uh, 20K, or gross 20K, then what we'll do is say, okay, well, we need to make $1,000 per bed per year. And from there, we can say, okay, if we have three crops in there, then we need to make $333 per bed, or per crop. And if we get four crops in there, like if we squeeze a real quick 30-day radish or turnip or something in, then we can say, well, with four crops, we need to make $250 per, per crop. So if we take that 180 heads, let me pull up the clicker here, okay, 180 heads, and take 80% of that as marketable yield, just to be conservative. So that gives us 144 heads that we're taking to market. If we take that 250 and divide it by 144 heads, we know we need to get at least $1.74 per head to hit that. We round up usually, so we do charge $2 per head for, for our lettuce. And at $2 per head and 144 heads, we get $2 or $288. So we hit that 250 mark that we were looking at, and we've got a little buffer. You now we can also think about it in terms of a square foot per crop. Um, but we sort of more, we're not going to go into it, but we think of, if we think that way, of square foot per time. So thinking about like how, and it's from floriculture and how greenhouses schedule their, their crop production of, the amount of time that a crop is in there. So we might say that it's, you know, 15 cents per square foot per day or something like that. But that's a, a longer example. So here's one for baby salad mix, right? We're, I'm very, very confident in this number. We've been doing it for 10 years now and, and one pound per six square feet is a really good yield. We definitely have gotten higher than that, but that's a good one to start with. So in 90 square feet, we can get 15 pounds. So to hit our 250, we need to charge 1667 a pound, which is pretty high, right? But we also get three harvests per planting, right? So if we get 15 pounds for each harvest, we're at 45 pounds. So instead of, you know, we take that 1667 and divide it by three, and we find out that we need to get 250 or 555 per pound to get in that $250 range. And then we can start doing fun stuff down here like this, like, well, what if I charge this much or this much or this much? You know, what is my dollar per, per bed gonna, per crop going to be? And we can start doing, so say we're at this $10, right, and we're at 450 If we were shooting for $250, we've already got a $200 buffer zone on there. And we can do this for, for tomatoes, and we have done it for tomatoes and peppers and, and all those other crops, too. All right, so Sarah asked, I sent a soil sample from her hoop house last fall and need to add fertility throughout the 2011 growing season. So what have we found to be successful or achieving good fertility in your hoop house? Number one for us has been compost, no doubt about it. So that's all nearly our, our only source of fertility. Um, we use a, a non-animal based or non-animal manure based compost for in the tunnels. Um, mostly because we're trying to avoid soluble salt buildup. There's a lot of stuff out there that's 
there's been a lot of people that are growing in tunnels that have salt buildup that aren't having any issues with it. So I don't want this to be like you have to use a non-animal based uh, compost so that you get uh, you know, no salt buildups from that are present in animal waste. I don't want it to sound like that. This is just what's worked for us and, and the reason we think about it is because it doesn't have as much salt as the animal based. So instead of using manure for our nitrogen source, we use hay for our nitrogen source. Uh, we've also used some alfalfa pellets. So there's a Bradfield product that I think is distributed by Purina now. It's at a lot of the, the feed stores. Um, and it's, it looks like rabbit pellets. They're rabbit food pellets. Um, and it's if we want to put some nitrogen in, we've done it straight into the bed, but we've also mixed it in with the compost. Um, it provides a fertility in the, in the tunnel, but you don't get those soil building benefits and fertility like you get from compost. Um, we've also had to, because our pH of our water is so high that over time, um, especially for the stationary tunnels, we've actually had to go ahead and put down some elemental sulfur to bring that pH back down. So I think you know the take home message is, is make sure that you do take soil samples. Um, and we take one annually. We usually take it after the fall crop and before, or after the spring, summer crop and before the fall crop. Um, and the amounts of compost that we put down tend to be about five cubic feet for every hundred square feet of production space. So you know, five cubic feet for every hundred feet of production space, which is really high rates, but we're asking so much of that soil. We're cropping three to four times in there. It's warm. We're putting water on. That organic matter gets used up a lot more quickly than it does in the field. So if you to kind of get a visual of that, a standard wheelbarrow that's got the you know one wheel in front um, and the kind of flat long or flat wide uh, box on it is about four cubic feet. So it's about one and a quarter of those for every hundred square feet of production space. So question number ten: um, What would your overall top three recommendations for a beginner be? So we just finished up a research project a little bit ago with 12 novice hoop house farmers. Most of them had no experience before they started growing in them. A couple of them had very minimal experience in small structures. Um, and this was one of the questions that we asked them as well. So I went back and kind of wrote down what I thought and then went and looked at, at what they you know, had said and kind of put them together. So you know, number one, I would say don't do too many crops at once. So what we did is provided that schedule for them and they saw it and they said, there's all these crops, I want to see how they all do and went ahead and planted them all and a lot of them said it was just too much to kind of keep all of them straight. So, so start with less crops and you can always add more. I think starting with spinach for the winter, um, as you start to do season extension stuff, you know, do the thing that, that is easiest to do that's least likely to fail and that's spinach. And we can plant at any time between September 15th and October 15th. It can go as seed, it can go as transplant, it can take really, really cold temperatures, and it does really well. So I think that you know, spinach is probably the number one you know, starting point, poster child for cold season production. Um, I think in, in there we can say make sure that you have a market for winter stuff or that you're in the process of creating one. So what you don't want to end up is, with is a lot of stuff growing and a beautiful things in your tunnel or in your hoop house and then no market to sell it to. Um, this is one of the big ones for that came out of that research project was to plan for more seed and other input costs and more time to spend in the tunnel as well compared to what you think you would spend of the same square footage out in the field. Um, and then we added in 3.5 is you know buy a seeder, buy a, either a pinpoint, you know they're expensive but they do if you're going to do baby salad mix they do great. You can get by with an Earthway or a Planet Junior, but having a seeder and spending that you know, investment cost is really going to pay off. And then most of the people I know, I'd say 95% of them, once they have a tunnel, they want another one. So buy that seeder and start saving and putting your money away for another tunnel so you can buy it as well. So I think those were uh, the questions that Sarah had, and, and there are some responses. And Luke, if you want to kind of give a where we're at and, and if we want to take some questions. Um, I'm good with that and we can see where Sarah's at. I've seen, her name's kind of popped up and popped off on my list over here so I'm not sure if she, she's here to answer some questions as well or, uh, or her, how we want to best do this.
Right. Yeah. Let me let me explain. Uh, Sarah's uh, internet uh, we we feel is being altered by the weather or uh, by high bandwidth of the evening uh, in her area, and uh, so she we've decided that she would just uh, she would just just listen in and use the chat box uh, if she if she can use the chat box. But I wanted to thank her for all her really good preparation uh, for those questions. I thought were really well thought out. And uh, sorry the internet didn't work work for you tonight, Sarah. But we. We definitely thank you for your for your preparation work. Uh, so I, I guess what I'd like to do is is take questions from the chat box uh, while we have Adam on, and we can uh, maybe take another five minutes of questions. Sure. So one just popped up about drip, and one popped up about uh, marketing as well. So. <clears throat> All right, so I figured they were all going to just start coming in, right? So, uh, well, maybe what we can do is say we're not going to answer all of them, but maybe what we'll be able to do is go back and take, uh, kind of put something together and then uh, answer what we can here tonight and then also go ahead and uh, take those questions and, and I'll take some time here in the next, you know, three, two or three weeks or so and, and write some responses and we can maybe post them up or something like that. So the first one was, um, Drip irrigation, what do we do about, oh, he was in reference to movable tunnels. So he liked movable tunnels. I would say that movable tunnels clearly allow for some leaching and some freezing and thawing. Um, we haven't had challenges in our, our stationary ones as long as we bring in larger amounts of compost and that we're taking soil samples. So I think that that's a, a good you know, starting point for that. And, uh, and we just, we haven't had challenges with, with our drip irrigation. Um, there was, let me pull up here a little bit, so there was one about how many market and restaurants do you serve and what's our seasonal income. So we only do one farmer's market um, because of our one, our off-farm jobs, as well as as we build up our farm, we didn't want to commit to a number of markets and then not be able to fill them. So we do a year-round weekly farmer's market in Bath. Um, and we're more or less sold out right now. So that's one of the reasons we're putting up another tunnel in the spring. So we, uh, we do one farmer's market. And then we also have email sales. So we send out an email. A number of people do this. We send out an email that has you know, our availability on Sunday night. And then people email us back. It's about a 170-person list. Um, they email us back what they'd like. And then they come to the farmer's market and pick up. So sometimes people call it a CSA. It's not a CSA. We don't take any um, upfront costs, or we don't take any upfront money from anyone. Um, they pay when they come and pick it up at the market. So that's the one piece of it. How many market and restaurants do we serve? So again, it's one market, and we are sold out already. So I think that's that's not a, a great thing to not have anything to sell, but it, it tells us that we need to be more building more tunnels. Um, and then... What's our income? So this year, starting in July, we started to keep really good records. And that was when the farmer's market started, which we kind of consider you know, our first real market. Our email stuff is, um, you know, in the winter, it's about $100, $150 a week. And then it's um, of just the email stuff. And then when we started the market, it was that plus we were make, what we were making at the market. And so we were just doing the numbers. And my wife is a lot better at them than I am. But I think we were somewhere for the six months in the realm of about eight thousand to nine thousand dollars. So I have to go back and look and um, and go ahead and and we can you know use that for six. So if that was a six month income, we were talking more about eighteen thousand would be our gross. And then we're pushing numbers right now to figure out net. But I think a pretty good estimate is somewhere around sixty five, sixty to sixty to seventy. So if we said, you know, our yearly could be 18K and we took, you know, let's just say be conservative and say we took, uh, you know, 60% of that. So that would be about $10,000. And again, we're growing on about a half acre plus. Um, oh, no, it looks like we've lost Adam. Uh, uh, his connection has been lost. So I think, as, as Adam said, we will take your questions. Uh, anything you put in the, in the chat box, we will take and submit to Adam. And he will answer them uh, on his uh, website, uh, hoophouse.msu.edu, I believe is what he said earlier. 
And uh, we're really sorry about the technical errors tonight, uh, the challenges we all face doing this remote uh, rural work here. But um, yeah, if uh, if you have a question that was not answered, put it in the chat box, and I will uh, submit that those questions to Adam Montry for uh, him to blog about on his website. Thank you all for coming tonight. And uh, again, I'll stay on for another few minutes to grab all the questions that you might have. Adam, are you back on? Yep, I'm back on. I'm not sure what happened there. It just bumped me for a minute. All right. Do you do you feel like working uh, for a few more minutes, or I I I told folks that we would just send your que the questions on to you to address in your in your blog. Sure. Yeah. I, I'm I'm here. I'm I'm good for a few more minutes if people want to yeah. stick around, or I'm good to to go ahead and, and take some questions. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. If you if you feel up to it, that sounds great. There's a question about an organic system. Do you have recommendations for maintaining potassium levels? So I believe that green, we don't use green sand. We use, um, basically we just have our compost and we feel like that is maintaining what we want it to and supplying the, the macro and micronutrients that we need. Um, uh, but I do know that some people do use green sand for potassium and we actually use some in our transplant mix. Um, would I consider tomato, cucumber, green bean a good rotation? Yep, those are all different families. So we've got solanaceous, um, cucurbitaceae, and um, fabiaceae. So that would clearly be a good three-year rotation. I think that, that, that that's a good plan. Um, early green beans for us, we did for the first time last year. And it really cranked out. And we made a good amount of money from early green beans. And then it went right into our field planting of them also. So I, I think that that's, that's definitely a good rotation option for, for warm season crops. Um, it can probably be put on in the cold weather. It, it can, but it's not pleasant. And uh, we usually try to put poly on between when it's around 65 or 70 degrees and, and sunny and calm. Um, what happens if it's a two layers, you've kind of got some, some play there because you can inflate the flan and it makes it tight. Um, if you've got a single layer and you put it on in the cold weather and you get it really tight, when it warms up, it stretches out and it becomes pretty loose. So you get that kind of expanding and contracting. So we tend to like to do it in the, um, in the warm weather. But that being said, we've clearly done it in the real cold weather when it's got to be done to get something planted. Uh, question about um, berry crops. So yeah, we, we're starting to do some work with Eric Hansen, especially with raspberries. Um, I think a good place to start is some of his stuff from, from Michigan State, and then Kathy Demchuk from Penn State, and uh, Marvin Pritz from Cornell all have publications out on berry crops in, in high tunnels or hoop houses. So we have a question that comes up a lot. So in an area of high winds, you know, how do we keep the structures from being destroyed? I think spend, spend the money and build a strong structure and, uh, and make sure it's built well and built correctly. And we've definitely had over 70 mile an hour winds um, and the structures that we've built so far have, have all stood up. You know, I think it's important to say that not all structures are created equal, that if you get something that's a 30 by 72 or a 30 by 96 from one company and you get the same size from another company and there's really drastic price differences, I think it's worth, I'm not saying that one is better and one is worse, that's worse, that's a balance of, you know, how much money you have to spend, what's, you know, and how much you, you want to spend, and cash flow is questions. But I think that it's important to say if you are concerned about winds, that it's worth building a, a stronger structure and adding extra wind bracing um, so that you aren't going to have things blowing away or pulling out of the ground. And I think the other thing is making sure that when it gets really windy that you go ahead and close your tunnel down. Otherwise, what happens is you get wind blowing right up in there. So if you have, uh, you know, roll down sides or, or drop down sides or roll up sides, that those get closed down when it's really windy so that that wind goes up and over. And while it acts like a wing and you do get lift, it's a lot better than having it go in the tunnel and lift off the top. 
um, which is different for the hay grove or the three season one, Tunnel Tech, hay grove, those manufacturers, um, where they multi-bay, don't have sidewalls, they tell you to go ahead and push it up so that the wind can just move on through. I think just like wind, snow also, if you have um, have a lot of snow, go ahead and build a strong structure. And we have some farmers that we work with on the other on the west side of the state, and they get lake effect snow off Lake Michigan. A couple years ago, we had 168 inches of snow, and they sent me a picture of uh, of a tunnel that bore less was a 15 and a half foot tunnel, and it had you know about three feet sticking out from where it drifted. And uh, that's not what we would like to see, but the tunnel was built really strong and really well, and it stood up to it. So there's a question about some fruit trees in the high tunnel. So depending on what kind of fruit trees you're looking for, you know, I would think about looking for some of the, the breeding lines out of Minnesota or um, you know, in the tunnel, it's, it's clearly buffered, and so if you're zone four, you might not need things that can tolerate zone four. So I'm not the, the best fruit person, but I know Eric, like for his raspberries, and, and Kathy and Marvin also have grown, you know, Caroline, Heritage, Autumn Britain, um, a number of other ones that are listed in their publication. Those are the ones that come to mind. And then Greg and the, the cherries, I know he's done... Um, most of the sweet cherries that are grown in Michigan. He's also done Rainier's, so, um, and, and they've done well in those tunnels. So, zone three, four, not four, four. So, you know, I think for zone three, four, sorry, I'm just scrolling down here. Um, I think that, that it's a challenge to grow year round. I don't know that I'm not going to say that it can't be done. Um, a lot of the farmers that we work with in the U or in the Upper Peninsula, you know, they get they do the 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 letter, or the spinach and some of the root crops, and they go you know into December. But you know, late December and early January and even early Fe or January and even early February is a challenge for them to have stuff in an unheated house. It doesn't mean that it can't be done, but they've switched to growing a lot more spinach than than anything else. So there's some options. What what options would you consider getting for a, a tunnel? You know, ridge vents. I, I don't think that a ridge vent is worth the cost. Um, there's some companies who do kind of the instead of the the automated or the motor driven ridge vent that that can cost like four grand for a 96 foot tunnel. They do ones where it's part of the structure and you almost you it's basically like you have a roll up on that um, ridge vent or on that peak vent. So those ones I think are affordable. Um, I don't. I still don't know that they're they're worthwhile, especially for our zone. We put louvered vents at the ends in the peaks, and in roll up or drop down sides. I think are definitely you know must go tos for for venting. Um, but the ridge vents, I think it's a balance between what you can save and what you actually get out of it. I mean, they work really well for flower production when you need to purge a bunch of air really quickly and change that over. But for tunnels. Um, you know, it's a, it's a balance between what do you want to spend and, and if you don't get that ridge vent and you can grow well without it, then that's other money or other capital that you can invest, invest in other places on your farm or in more tunnels. Very good. Well, I really think that we should probably call it, uh, call it on at that one. We really thank you both for uh, Sarah and uh, Adam for putting the work in to make this possible and you know, we will uh, definitely have this available on our website as well for others to watch uh, the recordings and uh, we will edit it so we can take out the parts that were not uh, functioning well. Um, so thank you very much Adam and if, if there are any questions you have I'm sure you can find Adam Montry on his uh, website and uh, we'll see you at the next Farminar in two weeks on uh, growing tomatoes inside and out with farmers from Vermont and Iowa. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. I appreciate you coming out.